And welcome, everybody. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm grateful to be here because Father Paul is our friend, is someone that uh, inspires us. So I'm, I'm grateful. I'm sorry, I always speak in Portuguese because I don't prepare in English. É, eu gostaria de, de dizer algumas palavras de maneira oficial e em nome de toda a Universidade é, Católica do Rio de Janeiro, Pontifícia Universidade Católica do Rio de Janeiro, a PUC Rio, é, nessa, é, nesse momento tão importante em que nós é, festejamos é, não só o aniversário, mas a existência é, do Padre Pou. Padre Paul, é, eu acho que todos vocês que o conhecem, cada um poderia dizer uma palavra, uma expressão de sentimento sobre a pessoa dele, mas como reitor e também como companheiro de comunidade, eu quero expressar minha gratidão, é, primeiro pelas pessoas que organizaram esse evento, que é fundamental, porque a gratidão é um dos sentimentos mais nobres e eu creio que nós devemos aprender a agradecer é, enquanto a pessoa está presente, porque esse agradecimento tem um peso maior e, e ele honra toda uma existência. É, as minhas palavras não vão ser longas, porque, de fato, é, creio que todos nós aqui coincidimos com esse sentimento da importância do Padre Paul é, nas nossas vidas, seja que ele tenha entrado 50 anos, 40, 30, um, alguns meses, ele, é, de fato, faz a diferença. Eu gostaria de, no entanto, é, ler uma... Preparei um texto. Na verdade, o que eu preparei foi alguns extratos de texto é, do padre Teilhard de Chardin, que o padre Paul ele tanto aprecia, um padre jesuíta, cientista francês, paleontólogo, geólogo, filósofo, teólogo, que participou de expedições científicas. E, em determinado momento, esse padre, é, Teilhard de Chardin, ele, é, escreveu um texto extraordinário chamado A Missa sobre o Mundo. A Missa sobre o Mundo. Gostaria de retirar alguns extratos desse texto, porque... É, a existência e a vida do Padre Paul, ela nos revela um pouco desse lado, diria, místico. né Quando eu cheguei aqui e vi a exposição da matemática, eu é, eu imagino que é quase uma experiência mística, porque <risos> só compreende quem, quem participa. Mas, é, voltando ao texto, é, esse texto eu gostaria de retirar uns, 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 um, algumas partes, porque ele, elas honram também um pouco a existência do Padre Paul. Eu dedico a você, Paul, é, esse texto, essas palavras que Teilhard de Chardin é, escreveu um dia, e é, são cheias de sentido, porque a sua existência é também parte dessa oferta de si mesmo e do mundo a Deus. Cito Teilhard de Chardin. Senhor, mais uma vez, nestas estepes da Ásia, não tenho pão nem vinho, nem altar. Então, eu me elevarei acima dos símbolos e até a pura majestade do real, e vos oferecerei eu, o vosso sacerdote, e sobre o altar da terra inteira, o trabalho e o sofrimento do mundo. Derramarei no meu cálice a seiva de todos os frutos que hoje serão esmagados. Meu cálice e a minha patena são as profundezas de uma alma largamente aberta a todas as forças que em um instante vão elevar-se de todos os pontos do globo e convergir para o Espírito. Que venham, pois, a mim a lembrança e a mística presença daqueles que que a luz desperta para uma nova jornada. E continua o padre Teilhar, Recebei, Senhor, esta hóstia total que a criação, movida por vossa atração, 
vos apresenta nessa nova aurora. O pão, nosso esforço, não é em si, eu sei, mais que uma degradação imensa. E o vinho, nossa dor, não é, ai de mim, mais do que uma dissolvente poção. Mas, no fundo dessa massa informe, colocastes, disso estou certo, porque eu sinto um irresistível e santificante desejo que nos faz a todos gritar, desde o ímpio ao infiel, Senhor, fazei-nos um. Paul, é, esses sentimentos, essas palavras de Teá de Chardin, elas exprimem, talvez, um pouco do que tem sido a sua vida. Né? Você consegue celebrar a missa sobre o mundo, um mundo que é um mundo de símbolos, um mundo que é um mundo da inteligência, da busca, da compreensão, um mundo que é feito de símbolos é, que, no fundo, talvez seja um esforço de dar razão para a existência, de compreender, que honram a história da ciência e a tradição da Companhia de Jesus. E, ao mesmo tempo, a sua vida, como esse texto, que fala sobre, de maneira metafórica e quase real, de um sacerdote que não tem patena nem cálice, que não tem altar, mas que faz do mundo o seu lugar de missa, a sua celebração. Então, eu acho que você tem feito 85 anos, e desses 85 anos, a maior parte deles, você tem feito é, do magistério, do ensino, o seu altar, e assim nos inspira a ser um com todos, fazer-nos um, um mistério de unidade. Então, eu quero dedicar essas palavras a você. Talvez eu sugiro que depois você envie em inglês o texto para todos, um texto lindo, e que você sinta também da nossa parte o grande orgulho que nós temos de tê-lo é, como membro da comunidade da PUC-Rio, é, a grande estima que você desperta em todas as pessoas e o grande sentido que a sua vida tem para nós. E eu termino com o meu testemunho dizendo que você desde que eu cheguei, foi a pessoa que me olhou com mais confiança. Mais confiança. E nada para um jovem, não sou tão jovem, mas nada para um jovem que tenha um grande desafio à frente é mais importante do que o olhar confiante de quem já caminhou. Muito obrigado, Paul. Você é prata da casa, você é PUC, você é a companhia de Jesus, você é um grande jesuíta, porque soube se fazer um com tanta gente do mundo inteiro. A sua missa sobre o mundo está sendo celebrada. E, nesse momento, é o momento da ação de graças da missa. E eu quero te agradecer por essa oportunidade. Que você seja muito feliz e que continue conosco. Muito obrigado, Padre Pô. Obrigado, Padre Anderson. Então, agora eu passo a palavra ao nosso decano, professor Sidney Pachorne. Well, good evening, everyone. I was speaking English. Uh, I didn't. Uh, our president is a tough act to follow, so my my testimonial will be much simpler. Uh, I've been uh, in Puki for 45 years since I started as a student back in '77, and I hadn't. Uh, I was not so lucky to to be post student, but for several reasons we have interacted over the years. Uh, we have common friends, uh, and we always crossed our, our paths at Puki. I always recognized uh, Paul's way of walking and hiking in his sandals, which is a trademark, right? Uh, and uh, I, I remember you leading your, your hikes up the Two Brothers Mountains and so on and so forth. I never followed you, unfortunately. But uh, uh, I am, my testimonial is not so much an institutional testimonial as, as the dean of the center, although uh, we are so proud of having you because uh, you incorporate uh, two words that our president uh, usually uh, reminds of us, uh, which is our identity and our mission. And I think you symbolize that so well, you know, uh, that the intended mission of the university, both scientifically and in human terms. And, uh, if I can pick a word to represent uh, my feeling about you, Paul, 
is uh, kindness. You were always so kind when we you know, had the chance to chat, had the chance to discuss a little bit. You've been also so positive about my recent role as a dean. You were always supporting me, on, as uh, Father Anderson just mentioned. So kindness is the word uh, you know, connected to competence, to the, your mission, to your presence as a, as a bright light a bright and smooth light in our community. So this is what I had to say. Thank you so much. It's a real honor for me to be here with these colleagues and, and you. Thank you very much. Happy birthday. Thank you, Sydney. And now we will hear Professor Pitombeira, Emeritus Professor from our department. <coughs> uh, good evening. Uh, I'm sorry I asked my, our foreign friends to excuse me, but I will speak in Portuguese. Uh, há alguns acontecimentos que deixam marcas profundas na evolução das instituições. No caso do Departamento de Matemática da PUC-Rio, um desses acontecimentos foi a vinda para o Brasil de Paula Alexandre Schweitzer, brilhante aluno, como tantos outros, de Norman Steinroth, com quem obteve seu doutorado em 1962. Conheci Paulo Schweitzer quando ele se estava conversando com meu orientador na Universidade de Chicago, Arunas Lioravichus, em uma chuvosa noite de outono. A posteriormente, Arunas me falou do brilhantismo da qualidade científica de Paul Schweitzer. Se eu fosse seguidor da astrologia, procuraria investigar que obscuras conjunções planetárias determinaram sua vinda para o Brasil em 1971, país em que se fixou mais precisamente na PUC do Rio, a partir de então. Uma explicação mais prosaica foi, por um lado, o desejo do departamento de firmar-se como centro de pesquisa em matemática e, por outro, a aquiescência da sociedade de Jesus para sua vinda. Disto resultou que ele aceitou o convite que ele fez para a Via PUC. Na época, eu era diretor, inicialmente como professor visitante, e de onde ele nunca se ausentou, exceto para completar sua formação de sacerdote ou visitar centros de pesquisa internacionais com vários tipos de a, bolsas ilustres. Não falarei aqui das atividades eclesiásticas, pastorais e comunitárias de Paul Schweitzer. Uma de suas características é a sua energia e seu espírito jovem, sempre aberta a aventuras e novos desafios. Ao longo dos anos, presenciei dois fatos que nunca esqueci. Um deles foi sua participação em um grupo que desceu por caminhos íngremes, desde o Pico das Agulhas Negras até uma localidade próxima a Resende, caminhada de todo um dia muito quente, durante o qual Paul Schweitzer incansavelmente se preocupava com os que ele via estarem cansados ou com dificuldades durante o percurso. Em outra ocasião, eu e minha mulher o encontramos alegre e cheio de energia, guiando um grupo de jovens pela trilha da Mata Atlântica do Jardim Botânico, em uma bela manhã de sábado. Sua energia se revela também nas inúmeras atividades exercidas no Departamento de Matemática na PUC, em vários cargos e comissões. Sua preocupação em manter o departamento inserido na comunidade matemática internacional fez com que ele promovesse e organizasse vários encontros internacionais na PUC. E um deles, no qual eu me encarreguei, eu me encarreguei principalmente da parte administrativa, pude presenciar seu cuidado com a parte acadêmica, assistindo a todas as palestras, fazendo intervenções cheias de, de sentido e trabalhando dias e dias, meses e meses, para a forma final dos anais do evento. Seus mais de dez alunos de doutorado, um dos quais faleceu prematuramente vítimas da Covid, se destacaram como pesquisadores ou professores, ou nas duas áreas. Por sua vez, eles orientaram dissertações de mestrado e tese de doutorado, passando adiante a formação que adquiriram com Paulo Schweitzer. Além de seus alunos de doutorado, Schweitzer, como professor competente e dedicado, influenciou muitos e muitos outros alunos de bacharelado do mestrado, hoje em várias instituições. Embora Paulo Schweitzer já tenha atingido a idade de aposentadoria confustória da PUC, pelo que eu sei, ele continua cheio de energia e envolvido em vários projetos matemáticos e outras atividades. Ok, então é um depoimento de há muitas e muitas décadas convivendo com ele, em várias, de várias, ou como diretor, ou como colega professor, ou como amigo. 
Venga. Obrigado por ver. Oh, my turn now. So, uh, when Paul arrived at PUC in 1971, I had just finished my master degree and I was starting as a PhD student at IMPA. Uh, things did not go so well for me at IMPA, and in 1975, I asked Paul if he could become my advisor. Uh, Paul generally accepted, although I was going to remain a student at IMPA, and PUC was starting her, her own doctoral program in mathematics under Paul's guidance leadership in, in differential topology. Uh, things went very well from then on, and I got my degree in 1976. So I'll tell you two stories of that time. Uh, I was working in a certain kind of foliations in RN, and I read a 1940 paper by Wilfred Kaplan, uh, Regular fur Curve Family Spheres the Plane, and I did a presentation to Paul. The presentation, half an hour, and said, Paul, listen there, and then he pointed to some lemma and said, this is this, this is the lemma. This lemma, this one, this should be generalized. And I thought, nah, he didn't get it. That, that, that's not it. And it took me more than a week to realize that that was the main lemma that should be be generalized, and that became the main tool for my thesis. And then after further along, as I, was, I said, I was screening foliation, certain foliation in RN, and Paul started asking. Why are you working in RN? Do you really need it to be in RN? And I thought, sure. Every construction I'm doing is in RN. How come to, if, it's, if it's not in RN, it won't work? But Paul kept saying, well, what are you really using of RN? And I, again, took me some time and said, ah, actually all I need is it's a simply connected open manifold. And this took my thesis to another level. Instead of being a paper on a theorem on a certain classification of certain kind of foliations in RN, it became something that said that if an open, a simply connected open manifold has a certain kind of foliation, then it's diffeomorphic to RN. So thank you, Paul, for being such a great advisor and for becoming my friend ever since. Obrigado, Fergie. Uh, since I didn't prepare anything written like uh, my colleagues here, I, the only thing I can do is to tell you how it happened that I'm sitting here uh, today. So uh, the story begins in 1983 during the Congress called International Mathematical Congress called Warsaw. 1982, which was postponed, as you could hear already, uh, when, uh, where I met Paul and many other uh, participants of this conference, including some our Japanese speakers, some people from Spain, uh, from Brazil also. And so uh, one of, among these people was Fabiano, Fabiano Brito uh, from Uspi. Uh, who decided to invite me to Brazil for some a bit longer period. So this took, I mean, all the bureaucracy, etc., took three years, and I arrived to Brazil in 1986. Uh, I stayed in São Paulo, but I visited also other universities like University in Fortaleza and Pocky. <laughs> and here I met Paul for the, let's say, second time. <laughs> And one day, uh, Paul and uh, Andy Whitman, another professor at that time of Pocky, invited me to a dinner in Botafogo. <laughs> and uh, after some Caipirinhas, they asked me if I have heard about Clavius Gop. Definitely, I didn't hear. So they explained to me, uh, what is this? <laughs> and then uh, they said, next year, we are coming to ICS, to Biris Rivet, to France. Maybe you, could, you have a chance to, to join us with my family. Uh, my family means my wife, who is sitting there, and three of our children. So there were five people trying to, to go to France from Poland in 1986. This was still the time of hard communism in Poland, so this was bureaucracy on both sides, Polish and French, was uh, strong. <laughs> 
But due to, <laughs> due to uh, Remy Langevin, who is sitting there, <laughs> we got French visas, and we succeeded to, to come to, uh, to this Clavius group meeting in Bursi Rivet. Uh, Paul, at that time, uh, using one of his uh, professions, <laughs> uh, arranged the whole house uh, in uh, somewhere close to Bursi Rivet, one family was going for summer vacation, and the family invited all our all my family to to his to their house. So this was our first meeting with uh, Clavius Group. But then a uh, few years after, due to again to uh, Larry Conlon, another speaker, another participant in, of this conference, we were I got invitation to St. Louis. I, we came to the States and we joined Clavius Group during the summer, and so on and so on. So this was the beginning. Since that time, we met Paul, I mean me and some members of my family, many, many times <laughs> at, foli at some uh, foliation conferences, at uh, several Clavius Group meetings, and so on and so on. So this is probably why I am here today. <laughs> Uh, because the story, the story is really long and, and very pleasant. And one moment, we also started to collaborate and we produced a, a paper, but this is not for today, this is for Friday, I think. <laughs> this is the topic of Friday. So, uh, just I would say, all the best to you, Paul, for another 85 years. Obrigado. Thank you, Pavel. Now, I left with him behind Stasha going to speak. What are they? Hey, I believe so. Toros adoram uvir sua langua nativa. So I'll revert to English. <laughs> I gotta say, I've known Paul longer than anyone else in this building. We were colleagues at Notre Dame for an academic year. Uh, don't trust any of the dates in this fall. Uh, two ancient memories don't always agree. So I'll just go on this way. Um, so we were colleagues at Notre Dame for a year, an academic year at least. However, our mothers claimed that we knew each other um, before we went to kindergarten. Excuse me, I've just got to catch up with my. So I think that was around 1939. <laughs> our, family our families lived on the same street in Mount Vernon, which is a suburb of New York. Paul and I both went to Princeton for our PhDs, but we did not overlap. I had left for Oxford for further work before Paul came. Our research has very little overlap, and we certainly never collaborated directly. Paul's doctoral supervisor, Norman Seenrod, was quite concerned that as a Jesuit, Paul's promising mathematical career would be compromised. So he suggested that Paul consult Marston Morse out at the Institute for Advanced Study, Morse having become a Catholic. And Paul says that Morse emphasized the importance of the first year post-PhD, when you're on your own, and it's your own research that you pursue. So uh, Paul took the advice, and that's why he came to Notre Dame, but just for one academic year to get his feet firmly established mathematically. Then he proceeded to ordination as a Catholic priest. My wife Anne and I attended Paul's first mass in his home parish. At the reception, we were seated with Steenrod, his advisor. They wisely put the two of us at a single table, probably the only other mathematicians in the room. Uh, Steenrod expressed his concern that Paul's promising mathematical career would be compromised by his priestly duties. I responded that having a parish to look after 
should not be much worse than having a family to look after. In fact, the joke, this probably doesn't translate into Portuguese, but in English, the saying is publish or perish. <laughs> but for Jesuits, it's a little different. Publish or parish. <laughs> so sometime in the 1960s, Paul was one of the few Jesuit mathematicians who met in the summer to strengthen their dual vocations. The conversations or seminars in the summers concerning mathematical interests, even though their fields were different, they were close enough that they could attend each other's uh, presentations. And this was to keep them active mathematically since their day jobs, so to speak, in the rest of the year were um, somewhat mathematically sterile. A few years later, they were officially called the Clavius subgroup of the Jesuits in honor of Christopher Clavius, for, who was responsible for the Gregorian calendar. So at some AMS meeting, I remarked to Paul that it was too bad that uh, families didn't have the benefit of similar summer opportunities. Paul took that to the founding members. Larry Conlin, who will, I think, talk after me, was one of those. So sometimes later, three families with children. Now, Ann and I had our son, Steve, and our daughter, Kim. Uh, we joined, and I think we changed Clavius forever. The Jesuits turned out to be excellent entertainers of children. And in return, the children had some very interesting insights into the readings of the mass from day to day. Our habit was after the presider would present a formal homily, then the congregation was encouraged to make comments. And the children had some very interesting insights. Uh, certainly, Clavius was never the same again. Although Paul and I never collaborated, our theses were a very tiny bit related, since both of us used some secondary cohomology operations. Then our research went in very different directions. As mentioned, Paul was a student of Norman Steenrod, while I was a student of John Moore, and they had very different approaches to mathematics, uh, which is very useful. Later, Paul and I did share a brief interaction in terms of foliations. Again, from my point of view, it was homological issues, whereas Paul is much more the geometer than I ever was. I would like to mention some of Paul's papers in particular, but they're far enough from my expertise that I will leave to other speakers here at the conference to take that care of that. So I still remain a homotopy theorist. Even my work in mathematical physics is primarily homological. I had hoped to renew contact with Paul as well as my former student, Eduardo Herfel, who just spoke this afternoon, there was a workshop, or was supposed to be a workshop, on fundamental aspects of string theory in Sao Paulo in June of 2020. But we all know what happened a little before that. COVID struck, and so this is my first visit to Brazil. So it's a great pleasure to be here to celebrate Paul's long and dual career. Paul, the Seisho Muitos Anos de Vida. Tam Nuita Sode, Paz e Alegria. Thank you, Nicolau. Uh, okay, now we are going to listen to Larry Collins speaking from the States. Nicolau is taking care of that.
uh, wait just a little bit, please. We, we, we are setting up the speaker. Paul, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. I can hear you. Oh, okay. And uh, we're just trying to get, microphone? Larry, we're just trying to get the projection onto the screen, which has just started. I see. So, you, please, you can, you can speak. We can hear you and we can see you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it really is a pleasure, Paul, to help celebrate your long and beautiful life. I, I believe that of the participants in this conference, perhaps Jim Stashup is the only one who has known you longer than I have. <laughs> we met, as I remember, in the mid-60s, probably 65, uh, at uh, a meeting of the Flavius Group, which you joined at that time. Yes. And all who know Paul well know how very important the Flavius Group has been in his life and how very important he has been in the life of that group. Um, my personal, there are so many things I'm thankful for in my relationship with Paul, but one of them is that he is the one who first made it possible and uh, invited me to get into this rather exotic field called foliation theory. At that time, very little was known, although I do think Paul knew about as much as anybody. I think perhaps Paul even understood Novikov's theorem at that time. I, unfortunately, hardly knew what a foliation was, but the Clavius group was attending a set of lectures of, of short courses at the Centro de Investigación in Mexico City. And Raul Bott, who had been my thesis director, gave a short course on characteristic classes of foliations. He spotted me in the audience and without any uh, uh, asking, uh, would I? He simply said, Larry will write the lecture notes. <laughs> well, I hardly knew what a foliation was, but thank God for Paul. After every one of Bott's lectures, Paul met with me and a few others and explained to us what Raoul was talking about and a great deal more. And it was Paul who first said to me, we, would, we really should be getting into this new field of foliation theory. Uh, I accepted that invitation, and it has been a, a very happy journey ever since. So Paul, ad multos anos, many more years. God bless you.
Mas eu vou ficar na frente. Como você quiser, eu Posso começar? Então, eu queria falar três coisas. Primeiro, queria agradecer. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my deep thanks to the organizers and participants of this conference, Paul 85. The local organi organizers, professors of Ufi and Puki, who are almost all dear friends of mine, have done an excellent job in the face of difficult obstacles. It's not an easy time. I'm grateful to other friends on the scientific committee, to the eminent research mathematicians who have come. And finally, uh, it's wonderful to have so many good mathematicians giving excellent lectures. Many collaborators of mine and others who've been friends for many years. I also want to take this opportunity to thank my colleague and dear friend, João Bosco Pitombera de Carvalho. I didn't know you would be here, but I had already prepared to say this, because we met when you were a graduate student at Chicago and I was spending a year doing research at Northwestern University. And uh, it was you who invited me to come to Puki. Uh, in 19, you'd invited me before, but I was busy with my theological studies, and in 1971, you renewed the invitation and for me to spend a year as a visiting professor at Puki. So that was the beginning of all of these years that have been so important for my life. I want to thank you deeply. Second thing I'd like to say, <clears throat> well, I wanted to thank the Lord, God, for all that has been done along these many years. I, uh, God has supported and guided me for 85 years. The second thing I wanted to say is about advances in academic quality. When I arrived in Brazil, as Freddie has mentioned, uh, he was the first master student of mathematics at PUC. Uh, and, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> along with several other Americans and Brazilians who had earned PhDs in some of the best universities in the United States in the early years of the 1970s, I helped to instill a, son, a sense of academic excellence in the mathematics department at Puki, which at that time was still in early stages of its graduate program. It's interesting, there was strong resistance among some younger faculty members who didn't want to have to finish their doctorates before getting a certain degree of tenure of stability at PUC. <laughs> but finally, the commitment in ac to academic quality won out. And the, ac the excellence, academic excellence at PUC has continued to advance up to the present time. Many professors who obtained their doctorates at PUC contributed to academic quality at many other Brazilian universities. Then in 1992, when Puki passed through an extremely grave financial crisis that many of the faculty members thought would destroy it, uh, several mathematical professors left Puki and moved to the Federal Fluminense University, which is sponsoring this conference. <clears throat> uh, and so uh, this, together with the action of some other uh, outstanding professors at UFI helped 
them to develop uh, a very good academic quality, which happily is continuing to grow and improve. Um, <clears throat> and the quality of this conference attests to the excellence of the Mathematics, Mathematics Institute at UFI. Uh, among the organizers are several professors with doctorates from Puki, following Hiku and Hiki Gautamon, and Leonardo Cavallo, who's the son of João Bosco Pitombera, who spoke for us, and uh, Emilia Alves. So uh, it's wonderful. And then here at Puki, uh, three of the faculty are on the, the uh, uh, organizing committee, and uh, many others from uh, the uh, from from the. Uh, uh, many authors who are speaking here. But I would also like to mention two of my doctoral students at Puki, uh, Sebastian Firmo, known as Saponga, and Sueli Druk. Both of them made important contribution, contributions to mathematics in Brazil. Uh, Saponga, starting about 20 years ago, organized a workshop on topology and dynamics. And every year, because it, before the beginning of the academic year, uh, this brought together young mathematicians from various parts of Brazil in topology and dynamical systems, Topedin. This continued until two years ago, when unfortunately, uh, Saponga uh, died from COVID-19. Uh, there was a year interval, but happily this year, the people at UFI uh, renewed this conference, which has been an inspiration to many young mathematicians, an opportunity for them not only to learn about what others are doing, but to speak about their own work, a real confirmation of their work. The other one I wanted to mention is Sueli Druk. Uh, She's an emeritus professor now at UFI. But the wonderful thing that she did, uh, I don't know exactly how long ago it was, a little less than 20 years, but she had the idea of creating a mathematical Olympiad for public school students. And uh, uh, she, with the aid of the man who was, of uh, Cesar Camacho, who was the head of IMPA, uh, tried to get support from the Ministry of Education, which did not support it. But then they were able to talk to President Lula, and he decided, do it. <laughs> and now this, this uh, mathematical Olympiad for public school students, it's open also to private school students, but this has changed the attitude of secondary school students in Brazil, instead of seeing mathematics as some kind of a terrible obstacle that they have to somehow get over, they see it as an interesting challenge, and so many have been attracted. Two or three years ago, the last time I had a number, number, the number of students who participated is quite incredible. I don't know whether you will believe it. 18 million. 18 million students. <laughs> so uh, that's what I wanted to say, and I, I'm so happy that, that uh, I was able to help Sabang, Saponga and Suli get to that stage. But now the third thing I wanted to speak to, and uh, in this I'm being a little bit uh, daring, and <laughs> I'd like to open my heart to you and uh, speak about what I find as most important in life. And I'm sure that uh, many will disagree with me, but I'm sure also that in this occasion you'll think that it was appropriate for me to speak. So you know that I'm a Catholic priest and a Jesuit member of the order. Uh, my inspiration throughout all the years has been the help of the Lord and uh, 
uh, belief in a good and loving creator, the source of all that exists, has guided me constantly. So I find in the guidance and support of God a source of strength in overcoming my limits and my negative passions. God is a loving father or mother who guided and inspired Jesus in his life and teaching. And my understanding of God is that he guides and fosters all that is good. He is the wellspring of human culture and science. I reject totally a view of God as a punishing or vindictive deity. The Christian God that I uh, know shows divine love and guidance, helping us to choose what really leads to happiness and what is best in the long run. So personal communication of love and intimacy with God is a great good. And I would wish that everyone might share this worldview with the resulting joy and hope. But in the modern world, and especially in the academic sphere, many people have a different view of reality. And each person has to follow his own or her own lights, the way he or she sees the deepest aspects of all that exists. Their perception of the significance of the universe and the destiny of humanity. And I would not anyone, would not want anyone to go against what they see as the reality, the basic reality, just to please me or to <laughs> uh, pretend that they believe in God. But I would like to say that I, it makes me very happy to see so many people who have a different worldview with no belief in a transcendent creator are following the deepest human values in their lives. In my understanding, and many of you will disagree with this, it is the Holy Spirit who is active in their lives in guiding them, although not perceived. I believe that one day beyond this life, they will hear the joyful words that uh, Jesus speaks in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 25. Come, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Uh, this, uh, I think I see so many good people and I believe that faith is more a question of what one does than what one professes, what one believes. Uh, I would just like to quote uh, a great Jesuit theologian of the last country, of last, com uh, last sec uh, century, excuse me, uh, called such people anonymous Christians. Uh, that sounds like trying to just sort of corral them into being on his side, but that is really what we believe, that God is acting in the lives of us all. Uh, I'd like to observe that it's a historical fact that the lives of the earliest Christians were totally transformed after the death of Jesus on the cross. The resurrection of Jesus, which Christians believe in, is not a historical fact because historians cannot verify it. But the change in the life of the early Christians is a historical fact. And one can ask, how can such an extraordinary, extraordinary change take place? Um, so uh, it's in the face of terrible persecutions, they lived a new life. And this testimony gives me strength to hope for a bodily resurrection beyond death and beyond the disintegration of our cadavers. The wife of an eminent mathematician, who I'm not going to say who, who she was, uh, once said to me, I do not need faith in God. And I think that's the answer to the wrong question. 
we should ask not what we need or what we should like, but what we think to be true, what we understand to be true in our most profound scrutiny of reality. So many will say that an ag agnostic or atheistic outlook is what seems most true. Then I shall agree that they should live according to that belief. Though I would be very happy for them to have a different belief. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to note two things, uh, that true religious faith and true science are not in conflict, conflict though errors and exaggerations on both sides feed uh, uh, apparent conflict uh, and can give the impression that it's, that it's inevitable. One thing, uh, uh, of course, the advances of science have illuminated and corrected the understanding of faith and of interpretation of the Bible, that's wonderful. No one, uh, well, I shouldn't, can't say no one, but I don't think anyone reasonable should say that the world was created about 6,000 years ago. Uh, modern contemporary cosmology for someone who believes is uh, an interesting understanding of the evolutionary strategy that the creator used. I should also mention, this, despite my conviction that there's no real conflict between faith and science, I should say that the institutional church has been one of the main obstacles <laughs> to progress in this, although many, many leading scientists have been, member, have been uh, 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 Christians and Jews. Also, I wanted to say that uh, the abuse of religious faith, using it for politics or for other means, for getting money, uh, which unfortunately we see so much, we've seen it in the last electoral campaign. This is a really a kind of prostitution, uh, and I hope that we can avoid that. So uh, finally, I'd like to thank you for listening to these my reflections, and I hope that each of you will uh, continue to look into reality and uh, to find reasons for hope and uh, uh, for uh, expecting a, a good and marvelous future. So thank you. Very good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite you to a cocktail now. It's going to be, uh, for those of you that don't know Pookie, it's, it's going to be on the next building to the right when you leave this building. You follow it all the way until the very end, or almost the very end, and then you go to the 11th floor. You take a lift to the 11th floor, and then you have stairs to the 12th floor, okay? But we'll help you find a way. Thank you all.